Well, it's your boy, Dustin, from Flying Chariots, The Rise. And hey, man, we got an awesome, awesome guest tonight. He's a contactee, Baron Lacey. So Lacey, can you tell us where you grew up and how this amazing event happened in your life started? Well, I grew up in Texas, but in like seven different cities. Before I was uh, six years old, my family has been in Texas for four generations. And my great-grandfather, he and his two business partners donated the granite to build the Capitol in Austin after the wooden one burned down. And in fact, he bought Granite Mountain in Marble Falls for a mule. He traded a mule for this huge granite quarry, but it it was just a, a mountain with rocks on it where they could not raise cows. So it was thought to be of no value. And he and his two brothers bred a dog that is part scent hound, part greyhound, and part coyote. And it is now called the Blue Lacey and is the state dog of Texas. Like I said, I've lived in seven cities before I moved to Seagaville, Texas. And we moved to Seagaville in 1956. And that is where I had my first experience. All right. Let's hear the first, the first story here of you interacting with these ETs. So where were you? Were you asleep or were you... Daytime, yeah, it's here. I was six. I was six years old, and mom would always put me to bed. This one particular night, she took me in, put me in the bed, tucked me in, and this was a real old bed that had iron bed posts, and it was up higher than beds are now. Um, so she would help me up into it, and then cover me up and leave. Well, this one particular night, she covered me up, and asked me if I wanted the door left open which I said yes, so the door, the light from the hallway would come in. We always did this same thing, and I was watching her leave, and I turned around, and there were three little guys at the foot of the side, the side of the foot of the bed, and they just, the bed came to about here on them, so they were about three or four feet, probably four feet tall, and they had huge heads, and they had huge eyes, and one of them kept sort of changing the way he looked. One moment he looked like a cloth doll that had been sewn together, and then he'd be back like the others, and then he'd change again. And I think he was trying to disguise himself, but it just wasn't working. And I immediately yelled for my mom, and I turned around to look at the door to wait for her to come in, and she came in fast. And uh, they were gone. So I told her what had happened. She didn't say anything. She just tucked me in. And she said, now go to sleep. You need to go to sleep. So um, now this was before I had started school. So it was before September. Um, but it was not real cold. So it had to be near summer. The, the next night, the exact same thing happened, except this time, my mother sat down on the edge of the bed, and she said, son, if they come in here again, don't call me, because when you call me, when I get here, they're going to be gone. You're just going to have to learn to deal with them yourself. And then she left the room and asked me if I wanted the door left open. And I said, yes. And I turned around and there they were. So this time, the third time was the charm. And they were back. And there was also a being standing over to the right, the left side of the bed near the wall. And I couldn't see him real well because he was not in the light from the hallway. But he, he actually looked like captain hook to me he had a large hat i thought i have since then figured out this was a mantis creature and he had a large head mm. but uh and he had a robe what i thought he had was a a um pirate's coat on like captain hook 
In fact, I thought maybe he was Captain Hook because Peter Pan was one of my favorite Golden Book things or whatever they were called at that time from Disney. And um, he started moving around. And to me, it was like he was dancing because he moved really strangely. And suddenly I couldn't move. It was like I was tied down to the bed. But I managed to look and I wasn't tied down. And the bed began, well, the room began to get bigger. And the bed began to rotate in the middle of the room. And what I figured in retrospective over the years is I had been transferred to the ship. So the bed was rotating and the little guys, it was like they were glued to the bottom of the bed. They were rotating with it, you know, right, right there. They didn't move. And um, this went on for a little bit. And I started getting where I was about to freak out and it was all gone. They were gone. The bed was back. The room was the right size. Everything was fine and I could move. I actually contemplated whether that was a dream or not, but I'm going, no, I never went to sleep. It wasn't a dream. Then I covered my blanket over my head. And I went to sleep. I put a pillow over my head, too. And I did that for years and years after that. Because my opinion was, you know, they didn't hurt me. They weren't really terrifying or scary. But I just didn't want to see them again. Because they weren't normal. That was not the way things were supposed to be. So I didn't see them again for years. But I did. I would have bruises i would have cuts little bitty ones i would have punctures and in fact um i was married when i was 21 and one day about the first or second year we were married she goes uh, well first we noticed a bruise on my leg and she said you know you hurt yourself when you're asleep more than anybody i've ever heard of <laughs> in 61 um several key things happened that um, different people attributed to god or to guardian angels or well, nobody talked about spirit guides at that time that was like in the 70s or 80s but um i don't remember which order they happened in i'll just go to this very first one uh, there was a song called Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight? And it had come over here from England. And um, it was a very popular song and it was played on the radio a lot. And at that time, I had gotten a radio that I was listening to every day in my room. And one night I go to bed and that song keeps playing in my head over and over and over the chorus of it especially but it would run through the whole song periodically and i couldn't go to sleep all night long i was awake with this song playing in my head and the next morning mom comes in and she goes all right you gotta get up because we gotta go to school and i said i can't go to school i haven't slept at all and she said what and she, i said i hadn't slept and i told her about the song but she didn't say anything she left and went into the kitchen and she said, well, come into the kitchen and get your breakfast. So I go in and she's cooking breakfast and I ask her what it was. And she said she didn't know. And and it was like that was the end of the conversation for what the song was. So she fixed me breakfast. And she took me and put me on the sofa and gave me a, a cola to drink and she said you watch tv you would lay here all day you do not go to sleep because you are going to school tomorrow and then she goes into the dining room and there's a double door without the french door there's a double opening door into the dining room from the living room and i see her and she gets the phone off of the wall it's a rotary phone she takes makes dials up phone dials up I think it had push buttons. She dials the number and walks into the kitchen. And I hear her talking, but I don't know who she's talking to or what she's saying. So 
I watch TV all day, cartoons and all kinds of stuff. And um, around five o'clock, my father gets home and he doesn't even say hello to me. He just walks right past me, takes my mother by the hand and takes her into the kitchen where I can't hear where they're talking. Then he comes out and he sits down on the sofa and he says, son, if you don't straighten up, we're going to have to take you to a psychiatrist. You know, I just heard a song playing in my head, although I didn't say that to him because you didn't talk back to him at all. He was six foot three or six foot four and looked like Dirty Harry. And he was a prison guard and he was dressed in his guard uniform. And um, he said, we Lacey's don't talk about ourselves. I didn't know anything that happened to my parents except what happened when I was around them. Now, I found out later that was a lie. But um, so we don't talk about it. We don't talk to people about ourselves. And you shouldn't talk to be people about yourselves. He said, and you don't want to be famous in the late 1800s or early 1900s. A female relative of yours told people that little men talked to her in her bedroom at night. I'm going, what? And I wasn't even thinking about 1956. You know, that was total. I never talked to it about anybody about it. So it just like, every once in a while I would remember it, but I didn't know what it was. And we didn't have TVs until I was six. So we didn't see a lot of stuff that people might see on television. Well, later I was thinking about it and I'm going, he remembered in 1961 what happened to me in 1956. So it must have been of more importance than I thought. Well, he said she told people that little men came in her room and talked to her and they locked her away in an insane asylum. Oh, and that's wow. what they called it. And she died there. And you do not want that to talk to happen to you. Wow. So the fact that this woman was blood related to you, right? Yes. That is yes. another like factor of why they were interacting with you in the first place. If they're, you might have a family, of, uh, a long history of your family interacting with ETs. Wow. That's pretty interesting. I found out in 2009 that I was an abductee. That's when I first found out for sure. I didn't know. I thought it was God or spirit guides or, you know, all kinds of weird stuff because my life had been saved for nine, nine times. Uh, in fact, when I was two and a half, I had a sarcoma, a cancer, and they had to operate on me. And at that time, no one had ever lived from it. Wow. And uh, in fact, they told my parents to go have another baby so it would lessen the blow when I died. <laughs> the next thing that happened in 61, because after he talked about it, that was it. We didn't talk about it anymore. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I was riding my bike to school when I was 11. We walked to school. Sometimes our parents would let us ride our bikes. And we were coming home from school. And we had to cross over a big road, and there was a policeman there who was the crossing guard. And uh, we're riding single file down the very side of the road when I suddenly noticed that this big Dodge or Plymouth is crossing the yellow line and heading straight for me. And I didn't know what to do. I, it was going to hit me no matter what. I mean, if I stopped, it was going to hit me if I kept going. And I couldn't speed up because the bike's in front of me and the bike behind me. And so it's coming straight at me. And then I'm on the ground and I'm rolling in front of this car. And I would come up and I would see the tire. I would see the bumper. I would see the light. I would see the sky. And then the ground, bumper, light, sky. Our tire, bumper, light, sky. Three times. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't move. It was like I was paralyzed, which is probably a good thing. I probably would have died if I could have moved. Well, 
then my body straightened out and I flew through the air and I flew between the first and the second wire of a barbed wire fence. They're only a foot apart. And I got one little cut in about 92 or 93, a man was killed who was thrown from his car and he went through a barbed wire fence. Only he went, looked like he went through a cheese grater. (laughs) So I, I flew through this incredibly small space and I landed on this thick grass because the, the hay had not been mown or anything. And, um, it twisted my ankle and I lost my glasses and I start to get up to look for them. And the policeman puts his hand on my chest and says, lay still. He said, you may be hurt and you just don't know it yet because that happens. So I laid there and he said he'd already called my parents and they'd already called an ambulance. The ambulance came, they picked me up, they stopped by my house and picked up my mother And then we headed for the hospital in Coughlin, and my father was going to join us there. And I kept insisting that I was fine. Well, the doctor checked me out, and he said there wasn't anything apparent, but he wanted me to spend the night um, to see if I was okay the next day. And they gave me a tetanus shot because of the cut. It's about an inch long. It's smaller now. And I was hit by my teacher's husband. Her husband hit me. Well, dad comes in and it's, it's, uh, he's, he ends up getting there after work and he says, Well, we've got your new bike for you. And I said, My new bike. And he said, Yeah, we've got a new bike for you. The Miss Kuntz bought a new bike for you. And I said, uh-huh. oh, I don't want a new bike. I love my bike. <laughs> I want my Mm. bike. He said, we'll talk about it when you get home. So (laughs) I went to sleep. The next day, woke up. They came and got me. And then once again, Dad goes, you're really going to like your new bike. And I said, I don't, I said, I don't want a new bike. (laughs) And he said, well, (laughs) just wait till we get home. So apparently he didn't want to argue with me for once. We get to the house, and there on the porch is a red and white American flyer with a pumper, a headlight, streamers coming out of the handlebars, uh, everything that a bike could have at that time. And, you know, in 1961, bikes were made out of steel. They weren't made out of aluminum. They were heavy duty. They were heavy, and they were sturdy. Well, I said, well, now I've got two bicycles. And he said, come with me. And he leads me around across the front porch and back down the drive. I mean, the carport. And there against the wall is my bicycle. If you had looked at it from above, it would have been shaped like this. Like a crescent (laughs) moon. And the bend was in the center where I was sitting. And the seat was almost two feet off of the ground. Wow. So that that car had hit the bike with some force. And obviously, I wasn't on it. Yeah, because you've been crushed. It would have crushed my leg and my pelvis yeah. completely. In hypnosis, I, I remembered uh, years later, well, in 2009, in hypnosis, I remembered that I was on that bike and then I was on a ship with two or three of them and they weren't talking and I could see through part of the wall and they flew over a store where I later worked and in fact when I was in high school I climbed up onto the top of that store to help another kid do something and I knew exactly what was up there I knew that there was the regular air conditioners and then some old ones just over to the side that had been replaced a long time ago, but they had never removed them. That's insane. Especially what happened with your bike there. And you look, finally looked at it. <laughs> it's like, damn, I could have been totally crushed right there. But yeah, again, yeah. you think these uh, ETs are looking out for you in a sense, making sure. Uh, I never had any. Well, I guess my closest brush with death was, I think, last winter. When I was shoveling 
um, my driveway close to the street. Now I live on a busy street and uh, the snow and there's black ice and yeah, some dumbass is going way too fast and uh, hits um, this um, telephone pole right right in the corner where I, I live in a corner. So this here's a telephone pole where I was standing and all these car parts, I had to dive out of the way, but I get showered with all these car parts and shit. I was just like, uh, I, was, I was probably this close to getting hit and smashed. But um, yeah, it's my only brush with death there. And no ET saved me in that one. <laughs> That's crazy though. Um, yeah, of course yeah. everybody thought God had saved me. And sure. so there's been so many times that I was told that I must have some special purpose. What was the time that these ETs revealed to you that, that you have a connection with them? That was in 20, I don't remember the date. It was sure. in 20 something. Maybe it was right before I published the book, which was in 2015. So it happened in 2014 or 2015. Oh, and yeah. um, I had been getting readings from this psychic in that I found in David Icke's book. He used her to help him find things oh, yeah. and to see what was going on. And uh, her address was in there in her email. So, and I love psychics. So I, um, I emailed her for a reading. It was a reasonable price. And she would, she sends you these things you had to do, like pick these numbers, a bunch of stuff, write questions, and um, you had to have your birth date. Because she would actually use your horoscope and different stuff as well as her cards and her just her psychic abilities. And she would send you an MP3 with the reading on it, and it would last an hour. I did it two years in a row. The first year, by the end of the year, everything that she told me was going to happen had happened. So I sent off for another one. And it was getting towards the middle or the end of the year. And I'm going, wow, things have been happening again. Everything happened last year. Maybe this one thing she told me was true. And what she had told me was, she said, now, you may think this is funny, haha, -ha, but you're one of them. <laughs> and she said, and you'll find out that you're one of them. So I thought, well, maybe that's true. That was the one thing that hadn't happened at that point. That was all that was left. So I laid down and I started thinking about it first, just regular thinking. And I thought about how I didn't really feel fit in in the world. Um, I did think about how many times my life had been saved. I thought about all these different things that had happened to me and the way I felt constantly. And I went into a meditative state and started thinking these same things even more deeply. And suddenly I felt emotionally that she was right. And I felt intellectually that she was right. And at that point, Two fingers reached into the back of my head, it felt like, reached, no pain though, shoved into the back of my head right where my spine column joins my skull and took hold of me. And I could tell I was actually a sphere, uh, an orb, and pulled me out. And the minute it pulled me out, everything was gone. The my breathing, my heartbeat, my body, the room, everything was gone. I was in total blackness. Now, I had achieved this state a couple of times, but it had always taken a long time. I hadn't experienced leaving my body except once or twice, but um, and it's not like astral projection. They could obviously just pull me right out, and they, I thought later. They had been just letting me get used to it when they were doing it or doing it for my own comfort. But this time they pulled me out of there and I was in this black void and I was a sphere and I could see 360 degrees around myself, although I can't even imagine that now. And 
suddenly a grid of light appeared in front of me. And I felt later that that was just to help me orient myself. And there a voice said, the council of three. That was the only sound. I didn't hear any of my own bodily sounds at all. And then in front of the grid, there were these three men that looked like they were sitting in thrones. They were look, they looked like they were made out of light that was shaped like men and sort of shaped like robes on them too. And they would have been seven or eight feet tall when they were standing up. And one of them, the one in the middle, he thought at me and he said, we're very proud of you. We've been waiting for you to realize this. And then all this noise started pouring into me that was a lot like a dial-up telephone when you used to dial up to get on the computer, all this screaming and all this stuff. And I saw things, I heard things, uh, all kinds of stuff went by. And it was so fast, I could hardly hold on to any of it. In fact, when I woke up, I remembered one thing like it had been driven home stronger than anything else. And that was, it said, your the interest on your debt are the chains of your slavery. And so I immediately set about, well, not that day, but immediately putting extra money into all of my debts and got out of debt. And it took a little over a year, but I did. And it made a big difference in my life after that, not to owe any money except for utilities and food. And there were other things they said that came to me a little bit at a time. And one of them was that I volunteered to come here and that I was going to be a walk-in and I was going to walk into this body at the age of two and a half while it was being operated on. But the soul that inhabited it decided it didn't it wanted it for two and a half years which were going to be the best years of the life of this body and they really were for a long time and but it didn't want to go through any of that and it decided it didn't want to come at all so i had to be born here instead and when i was born i lost all the information that i would have brought with me if i had been walking in i would have been more psychic I, and I would have known everything. Well, what a trip. <laughs> right? To hear that the first time? Holy Christ. Yeah, it'd be blowing me back a little bit. And like, the, I'm just, it's so cool that I, I even like just my, like, there's a theory out there that we're like, ourselves are like a refugee race of ETs that crash landed here thousands of years ago. They had to start from scratch again. You know, and just had a, like, you know, maybe had like a base or maybe Mars was once inhabited by humans at one time and gone to war with each other. And you see what's there now. So you find like certain elements that you find in a nuclear blast there in Mars. So it makes you wonder. Or maybe if these ETs there are having their own wars against each other, because you always hear that in all these Bible stories from all around the world of God's raging war with each other. I wanted to give fire to the humans. No, they're not ready. Yes, they are. <laughs> that's uh, I just love that shit. That's the, that's the ancient astronaut theory. But yes, um, again, this is the connection that, like, again, if we over this race of lost ETs, and then we are connecting in a sense with you know all these extraterrestrials because we're like this star brothers and sisters, um that you know they're all keeping in touch and i mean you know having you guys pass the message of there's they're here and they've been watching you know and they they have their own agendas obviously i mean i'm pretty sure you're not the only you're not the only kid they're you know they're messing with <laughs> but um, right. i'm sure not. yeah no it is amazing though i love these stories and uh, again when you first told me the, the beginning of the story um when you were in your bed and you couldn't move and you saw the three 
at the bedside and then your bed totally like rotating or like it may, maybe like maybe it made it seem like it was rotating but the sense they were all like with you in, in that rotating with the room was even trippier oh man i would flip the fuck out and then like could you, I, I can imagine you can scream if you wanted to right no i no. couldn't Isn't that weird that's so trippy too and tell me more have you interacted more with these mantis beings or is this once and just that one time that you saw this thing that kind of looked like captain hook in 2009 i was taken on a ship after right after i found out i was an abductee i kept thinking maybe i was insane and i i thought about all these things and then i, I thought well i knew i had heard about implants I knew I probably had implants and they could probably see what I see, hear what I hear and know what I'm thinking. Mm. So I thought I'm going to ask them a question and I'm going to ask them every day. I was retired. I'm going to ask them every day until they get sick of it and decide to give me an answer. And I'm not going to stop. So I have an electric line that runs through my woods on my property and I, uh, they clear under it, you know, they mow under it all the time, or not all the time, but once a year. <laughs> so, and I had kept it mowed myself, too. I decided to walk out there, and um, I don't think the electric lines had anything to do with the experience, though. But I started asking them questions, and I finally boiled it down and said, I want to know what's happening to me. And I want to know if I'm crazy or not. I want to know what y'all are doing. And I said those three things over and over again for um, six hours a day. Wow. And on the sixth day, I was going to go play my guitar and sing some country songs at a little restaurant near here. I hadn't played anywhere since high school. And there were about 20 people there, my audience. And uh, I started singing and I was doing pretty good. And then I started forgetting the words and they were like flying out of my head. So I would make up words. Of course, these people knew the words to those songs better than I did because I had not been a big country Western fan at that point. And until then, break time, this man comes out of the audience and uh, his name was Jimmy Daniels. And he became an extremely good friend of mine. And he told me... He, that he was a guitar player professionally and he and he had been and uh to give him my guitar and to get my words out of the my guitar case and sing the songs from the words and we'd get through the the, the thing the show so we did that and it worked out real good and uh in fact later one guy said you know byron just sits here at the table and listens to everybody and doesn't say a word and then he gets up there and he sings like a bird so that was a good compliment <laughs> um like i was two different people mm -hmm. well the we got through about 10 30 got the car loaded at about 11 and i headed home and i decided to unload it the next day and I couldn't uh, lay down. I was used to going to bed at 10, so I had overshot my bedtime, which is bad for sleep for me. And I couldn't go to sleep. My mind was racing and still thinking about the show. Oh, and the last song I had sung, even though it wasn't country western, it has a country western rhythm to it, which was Hey, Mr. Spaceman by the Birds. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> yeah. And everybody thought it was a country western song they just had not heard. Uh, so I decided to, that if I'm not going to go to sleep, I'm going to meditate. And I had a CD made by a company named Zygon at that time, which had, uh, rhythms in it that would put you into a trance. The guy that owned the company is still in existence and doing things. But anyway, so I put this on and I got deeper and deeper. And then I woke up and I was in a hammock, but it was tied from side to side instead of end to end. It was this hammock 
it was a material that I had never seen before. Uh, it almost looked like parchment, except real thick or leather, but it wasn't. It was some kind of cloth. And um, I grabbed, there were blankets in there with me, too. And I could see in the dim light that one of the blankets was a, a child's blanket. It had a pattern on it, like a child would have. And they were different ages. The blankets were, and I mean, slightly deteriorated, almost brand new. You know, they had been there at different times or started there at different times. Well, I reached up ahead, my hand to the edges and pulled myself out and landed on the floor. And I couldn't see very well. And I thought my glasses were dirty and I reached up to pick them up and I wasn't wearing any. And I went, oh, well, I went to bed without my glasses. And uh, I didn't have any clothes on because I went to bed without my clothes. And I look around and I, it's, it's far enough away to me from me, the walls, that they were all sort of foggy. And they didn't seem to have any decoration. In fact, the only thing that appeared to be in that room were the three hammocks. Because I realized there were three of them. And I was going to go walk over and look at them. And then I thought, I'm in a spaceship. They're showing me that they take me in a spaceship. And I got really excited. And then I hear this noise outside of this opening that I would just call a door. And I went, oh, ah, I am not ready to meet aliens. And then <laughs> everything went black. And then it went back up. It was like a fade to black in a movie and then fade back to light. And I'm laying on this metal table, and uh, it was a lot like an examination table in a doctor's office. And there were three little men down at the lower end of it, the same ones just like when I was in 1956. Only instead of Captain Hook, there was this really strange looking guy with a large head, two big eyes, wearing a robe that was i think purple and it had some kind of a pattern on it and um i couldn't really see his hands i could sort of see his fingertips and they were odd and at that point i was getting ready to freak out and he <laughs> thought at me he said don't be afraid and instantly i was relaxed and i wasn't afraid because it wasn't his words reassuring me he had commanded my nervous system control wow. okay that's interesting and, um, then the room turned i mean everything turned okay then suddenly i was there in that room and i was watching it from my bed which is odd because i was facing where i couldn't have seen it no i wasn't i could see it and daryl i talked with daryl sims i had made connections with him and he's called the alien hunter he lives in Houston, and he researches abductions. And he's cool. written some books, and he goes to festivals, and he knows Kathleen Martin and their friends. And so he's in the circle. Um, he had told me, well, he told me after I told him about this experience, that they can control, they control your perceptions, and they can actually make you see x-ray. Okay. At first, I saw black and white like a movie gray screen black and white and gray you know all that huh. exactly like a movie and at the same time i was laying there in the on the table and then the picture it was like starts like a matte frame it starts moving in and all i could see was myself from my neck to my knees and my knees were bent because my feet were on the edge of the table which was not as long as I am. It was more like around four feet long, maybe four and a half. And um, then everything was x-ray. Now, unfortunately, the grays were not in the picture. They were past it. it where all I could see was me. I couldn't see the being either. Or I would have been able to see in their bodies, which would have been pretty neat. <laughs> that I could see inside of me. I could see my skeleton. I could see my organs. And then they did the anal probe, and I could see that, too. It used to embarrass me to talk about it, but I've sort of talked about it a lot. So sure. they did that, 
And then I was awake and I was in my bed and I felt fine. And then I rolled over and went to sleep. Now, this sounds normal, but no, it takes me an hour or two hours to go to sleep when I lay down, and especially at that time. And um, I just lay down and went to sleep. The next morning I woke up and I went, wow, I was on a ship. And then I started crying and I didn't know why I was crying. I didn't feel like I should be crying. I didn't feel upset, and, but I cried for almost an hour and it stopped for a little while and then it started again. Then after it stopped, I grabbed this sheet of paper that I kept next to my bed and I drew the really big creature because the, see, a friend had told me I was an abductee. And I'll tell that story in just a minute. I'll just skip that. But um, I went over to his house and I told him what happened. And he's just sitting there and I said, but I have proof that it was a dream. <laughs> so because this guy, there's no way he exists. And I unfolded the picture of the mantis creature and I didn't know what he was. And I laid it down on the de desk. He was sitting in front of his computer. He turned around. And he typed in a bunch of stuff on his keyboard and he said, come here. So I walked over there and there was a child's drawing of the exact same being that the child had seen during an abduction. And it was called a mantis being or mantis creature. And the fact that this mantis wears a robe, you know, like has to wear some kind of clothing. And I've heard that in other cases too, where, people who interact with these mantis beings have these robes or long cloth for the hands. You could barely see their hands sometimes. And then, um, yeah, they're always the ones to kind of reassure people that it's going to be okay and stuff like that. But again, very terrifying to look at at the status. same time. Mm -hmm. It also shows status, their rank. They're mm -hmm. higher above everybody else. They're from what I've gathered from talking with them, or having them talk to me, uh, they're brilliant. They have an extremely high IQ. And they're mm -hmm. very factual about everything, but they have a sort of a sarcastic sense of humor sometimes. <laughs> and do you hear this theory too about um, how there's the reptilians versus the the Nordics? And they're kind of fighting over this planet, and the, the grays are kind of those ones that kind of came in, kind of third party, kind of like I don't know if it's there, like a neutral type of um, beings in this intermix of this raging war on Earth. <laughs> or I don't know if they're fighting on Earth technically, they might just be taking the beef out in space and fighting it out there. Because why would they want to destroy yeah. something they both want to keep, right? So it's kind of like, um, and there's been ancient stories too. Um, you know that serpent mound, and where they <clears throat> they claim that Native Americans talked about um, the gods raging war with each other in the sky over that area. That's that's where the serpent was kind of the, the reptilians chasing away the the Nordics. But yeah, again, very fascinating ancient stories that I kind of like to correlate <laughs> with other stories that you know because they are they've been here for a long time, and they've been they have you know again their own agendas and if if it is an interact with some of the other ets that have been working on this planet it's kind of like um i don't know because i heard there's like 35 races of ets kind of just doing their own thing here <laughs> and not liking each other and there, there could be like this inner uh this galactical federation where even the u.s is part of this with black programs and stuff like that and uh yeah no it's yeah, and again, did you see all this? I don't know if you watched some of the news. That like, I think Jimmy Carbell um, released some military videos of a jellyfish UFO taken in uh, 2018 over Iraq military base. It's a really interesting film. It's <laughs> of this thing. This uh, it goes from black to white. I think it's just shifting from cold to hot. And yeah, very. The fact that like stuff is starting starting to emerge and leak out, and now Congress is starting to talk. You know, this is like the big slow drip of disclosure, and uh, and you know, it's like, um, 
especially if you're still interacting with these beings off and on, maybe they're going to reveal to you that some, something big is about to come, you know, like maybe then physically interacting with us finally, because there's, there's that incident in Florida too, that recent people are claiming that a portal opened up at a mall in Miami and three shadow beings came out of it 10 feet tall and people who were concealed carry were taking shots at it and they were it was glitching while it was you know getting hit and <laughs> real sci-fi shit and then uh yeah the fact that it needed like the whole presence of like the whole state of florida's police force <laughs> there at the scene yeah it's very crazy and this weird cover-up people are not talking people are scared to talk and <clears throat> i don't know maybe this this is the year the fact that there's there's war there's two different wars going on this might be enticing some of their interest or maybe this time to step in or who knows. And maybe they were going to reveal that to you soon. Cause it seems like they're kind of like taking their time to reveal who they are to you and what connection they have to you. You know what I'm saying? They kind of, maybe, you know, they're taking their, their time to tell you exactly what's going on. Yes. And maybe they maybe just want to tell you what they want you to know too. Who knows? Like that's, a, that's a, but again, the fact that they're not hurting you, and they're not telling you that they have some crazy plans to wipe out the human race. I mean, they, they're they interacting with you on a purpose. And the fact that you have a family history of these things interacting with your family. And um, even, like you said, like was it your great-grandmother or something that got thrown in the loony bin? <laughs> and your family's like, you need to hush up about this crazy shit that happens to our family. <laughs> Well, you know, in nineteen in nineteen sixty one, even it would have been a you could lose your job talking about stuff like that. Sure. Well, even sure. in even when I found out in two thousand and nine, I could have lost my job. In fact, I think that they waited until I retired because <clears> I was working for the state. They waited until I retired for me to find out what happened, what was going on. And uh, I was, I had this friend who researched all these theories about stuff, the royal family being lizards and all, all of that and UFOs. And um, I listened to him some, but I didn't really, it didn't interest me. Sure. And I was in town, I was going home after eating dinner and I was in front of Walmart at the stoplight. It's a four lanes and a turn lane in the middle. And a plate, the thing that looked like a plate made out of water, appeared at the end of the lot and started expanding and got to be three or four feet across, maybe four to six feet across. And it looked like swelling water, but it wasn't water. It looked like the uh, Kurt Russell um movie about the time portal okay and, and except it did not have a frame around it and i watched it and i watched everybody around me and nobody was seeing it but me and then the light changed and it exploded into the air but before it got to the ground it disappeared with all the droplets hmm. of it the next i told my friend about that and he didn't say anything which was weird because he always has his opinions the next week it happened again and um the same day about the same time as far as i can tell i went to his house and we were going to walk the creek because we walked every day for help and uh i told him about it again and he didn't say anything we got back to his house and said man what do you think this was and he said uh do you want to know and I said, yeah, I want to know. He said, are you sure you really want to know? And I said, yes. He said, okay, I think you're an alien abductee. He said, you've told me all these stories the whole time I've known you, all these things that have happened to you. And then this, and I said, I think you're an alien abductee. And I've thought it for a while, but now I'm pretty much positive. And I said, you're crazy. And he said he turns around and he writes down some web pages and he said, "Look at these when you get home." Well, I threw it on the table when I got home and I didn't mess with it. And he kept bugging me to watch it every day, bugging me. 
So after about four days, I went into one of these and it had 99 questions. And if you asked, answered like 80 of them, yes, then you were probably an alien abductee. Well, I answered all of them yes, except except for the ones that were for women. I also found a page about PTSD, and I went and looked at that, and I realized I'd had PTSD for a long time, just didn't know it. Sure. So that's how I discovered that I've been taken and abducted. It probably started from your childhood, that PTSD starting with that uh that room situation where they had me uh saying oh shit <laughs> yeah. uh, i'm i'm gonna check out now for this pdsd that's insane oh man how again when you told that story in the beginning i was getting goosebumps i was like oh like how like, i could see that being like, in a part of a movie too and you uh have you interacted with any other humans uh, that we're interacting with these beings kind of like um if you saw them obviously if you saw the movie um uh, communion i think there was a part where the, right. there's a bunch of children all in a room together and they've been like it's like a group that always kind of stay together and get inducted together and uh and interacted with these other people at the same time i'm just wondering if you had seen anybody else besides these creatures humans like Maybe just other people who have maybe been abducted or contacted. Well, after I started talking about it, I would have some people go, hey, they, w- they would wait till I was away from everybody. And they'd tell me what had happened mm. to them as a child, that they had yeah. never been able to understand what it was. Sure. Like one of them had a very classic uh, where the, the saucer goes over the car. The radio turns on, the lights start blinking off and off, and everything dies. And then the ship is going away, and there seems to be a point that he doesn't know what happened, what was going on at that point, if anything. Mm -hmm. So I've had several people talk to me like that. That's cool. Okay. I've seen people in grocery stores, especially women, because they're wearing short pants. And they'll have the bruise on their leg, on the back of their leg, on the calf, that's about that big around. And it's already healing, but I've seen marks on people. That's interesting. Man. And you said you wrote a book. Is that right? Yes. Okay. How about you? you Yeah. Hold that up for us. Let's have our audience check that out. Where Where can people find that book? It's on Amazon for sure, and it's in paperback and electronic, so it's uh, less a lot less expensive for the electronic one. And I think sometimes if you buy a book and you're a member of um, whatever they call it, Amazon Prime, you yeah. can get it for free, the, huh. the electronic one. I don't know if they're still doing that, but I would still get my cut. I've gotten uh, – I checked it just a week or two ago and i've gotten a lot of reviews that i had not realized it built up that much yeah as i say it looks pretty thick there so it's got a lot of it's pumped with a bunch of stories there 439 pages okay well hey uh, we're getting close to the end times here so i want you to tell people where they can get a hold of you and maybe again you just dropped your book so people should definitely pick that up that sounds very interesting Especially if you're getting great reviews about it. So yeah, tell people where they can find you. Maybe your website or your email or Facebook. Or I'm on Facebook, and I have like three or four. I've I've got one that I go to almost all the time. But there, I got hacked months ago in like February or March of the early in the year last year and uh got thrown out of there and a lot of weird stuff happened because of that and cost me a lot of money and um i couldn't get facebook to get my page back and then they just abandoned it one day i went looking at it and i could get in i changed the phone number changed the password i had it back again so i've got three or four pages but i mainly use one it's my main page and it has the most followers and the most friends. And okay. um, 
I've really gotten into doing reels and I do them there too. And I just did one about an event that happened to me in 2013 and it's had 500 views in less than a week. So I was very oh, proud of that. That's cool. And I use artificial intelligence uh, rendering to do the pictures. My email is all little letters, Byron Lacey, B-Y-R-O-N-L-A-C-Y, two one at yahoo.com cool we'll, we'll put it in this description too uh, in the youtube thing so people can check it out well again that was so awesome uh thank you again for sharing your story that's quite a story too you had and again we might have, to have you back because i'm pretty sure you you probably missed a few things that you uh didn't get to share we haven't even touched the surface <laughs> well cool then we get one time i was talking to the mantis psychically and i was trying to find out stuff about them because they never tell me anything and i thought i've got it i've got the question and i said why did you say my life so many times and he said we want you alive which was no answer to my question at all of course they want to be alive <laughs> oh i don't right. know why but right. they didn't they're clever well, there is a reason to talk to me. That's why. That was the reason we get to this point right here. <laughs> to get our get some more views and uh, the people that hear your story. Yes, again, um, that was very, very interesting. So I have to thank you again. Thank you. So I want you to stay with us for two more minutes. 